Hi everybody, welcome to the next episode of our Stroke or Brain Attack series from PRS Neurosciences. My name is Dr. Sharan Srinivasan and I'm a uh, stereotactic and functional neurosurgeon and head of the Department of Neurosciences at the Bhagavan Mahavir Jain Hospital, Bangalore. Today's episode is on brain hemorrhage. Brain Hemorrhage also means intracerebral hematoma or hemorrhage or clot. There are a lot of different words people use so people get all mixed up. Bleed, once it bleeds and then the blood clots is called a clot. So bleeding, clotting, they're all variations of the same things that the medical profession uses interchangeably. So don't get too stressed out that they're all different things. They all more, more or less uh, happens to be the same variations of the same thing. Intracerebral hematoma is very different from ischemic stroke. In ischemic stroke, like I said, inside the blood vessel, a small clot happens. In the 70% of strokes are ischemic strokes. This hemorrhagic strokes are a smaller subset of that, wherein because of high blood pressure or some, some other defect in the blood vessel wall, it bursts like a time bomb and bleeding happens because it's like a pipe leaking and the water coming outside the pipe. Very easy, that's the simplest ex ex example to understand what is this intracerebral hematoma or ICH. Commonest with undiagnosed hypertension. People do not check their blood pressures, do not check it whether they have it, they don't have it, BP goes high and it ruptures like this. There's a small subset of patients where this can happen even without the blood pressure being high. Whoa, no, how did that happen? But that is a subset I'm going to talk in the next video called subarachnoid hemorrhage because of aneurysmal bleed. So be watching the next episode, you'll get information on this. We come back to the high blood pressure induced brain hemorrhage. Now, if you look at the skull compartment, we have, you know, there's two compartments uh, vertically. One is called the supratentorial, other one is called infratentorial. These areas, you know, uh, patients behave very differently when they have brain hemorrhages. And also you have the right side and the left side on both sides, or both these compartments. So it's not just about brain hemorrhage, it's a brain hemorrhage and a brain hemorrhage. It all depends on which areas of the brain, which compartments is gone affected, based on which the size of the hematoma to create the problem is much different, decision of surgery, not to operate, survival, no survival, and things like that is all very, very different. So depending on if it is supratentorial on one side, either it's in the frontal lobe, temporal lobe, one of the lobes of the brain, or in the basal ganglionic region, which are the two commonest areas, large enough, then we go in and operate. So in ICHS, we have two decision-making protocols. One is surgical, one is non-surgical management. When do we do no surgical management or you know conservative treatment is when the clot is not very big or the ICH is not very big, the pressure on the brain is not too much, and then we try to dissolve it medically with time and medicines. Okay, in the midline shift on the scan, those decision-making, you leave it to us, we know what's going on, and then we make those decisions. And the clot, if I do not operate, the clot dissolves or disappears in 8 to 12 weeks. It doesn't promise that the damaged brain will recover. It just means that the clot will disappear. That means, what am I trying to say? That means physical healing is not necessarily important to functional outcome. Functional outcomes happen based on how much of the nerves are still functioning. And also, with comprehensive neurorehabilitation, stroke and neurorehabilitation is another topic that you'll be hearing later on by you know another expert speaker make sure you're tuned into that also. Then coming back to the surgical management of intracerebral hematoma or brain hemorrhage. If the clot is very large, causing high pressure inside the brain, because of which you have life-threatening problems or high morbidity and mortality as what we call, which means a lot of disability, then we have to go in as an emergency or semi-emergency and remove the blood clot to reduce the pressure on the brain, on the normal surviving brain, to make sure that the mortality and morbidity becomes lesser. So there are different kinds of surgeries. We can make a burr hole and take it off. We can make a small craniotomy and take it off. Or the classical thing that we do is we do a large decompressive craniotomy. We remove the blood clot and remove the bone and keep it in the anterior abdominal wall and allow the pressure on the brain to heal over the next few weeks, after which we put this back. So these are all done in you know specialized centers which have all these facilities available, not only to do the surgery, but manage such patients perioperatively because the neurocritical care is as important or more important than neurosurgery per se in these kind of stroke patients. 
Now, if I go to the stroke in the posterior fossa or in the supratentorial, infratentorial compartment where the cerebellum, vermis and all are there, that creates a different set of uh, risks. Smaller clots can become more disastrous, more urgent, more uh, dramatically they worsen and die. So that means we need to move very fast, especially in these situations, to remove the clots in the posterior fossa so that, you know, we save their life and the quality of life. So it all depends on which areas of the brain is having a hemorrhage, what is the size of the hemorrhage, how much of pressure it is causing. Based on all this different data that comes with serial CT scans, we try to decide whether it has to be managed conservatively or it has to be managed with surgery. Sometimes the, the clot is managed conservatively the first one or two days, third day the clot becomes bigger and surgery is sometimes done even the third or fourth day. It doesn't mean that the first day clot is less, doesn't mean anything. So you have to keep on doing serial CT scans. The first two days or 40, first 48 hours, we do scan sometimes twice a day, every 12 hours. And then every day or every other day, depending on how the patient is looking and how the scan is recovering, based on that we decide what is going on. And then the post-surgical uh, care treatment continues and then rehabilitation follows with that. Some of these patients, you know, especially post-ICH patients, subsequently early or later develop something called obstructive hydrocephalus or fluid block in the brain. All of us have fluid in the brain, it's called cerebrospinal fluid. Usually about half a liter is produced by the body every day and the new uh, fluid comes in carrying nutrition to the brain. The old fluid exits uh, removing the dead tissues and the rubbish from the brain. So there's a circulation happening constantly. So if this hemorrhage bursts into that water containing cavity, or obstructs the outflow of the absorption areas for some reason, like our you know, drainage pipe getting blocked because of rubbish you throw on the top, then what happens, the in is happening, the out is not happening. So assume, imagine that 500 ml of fluid is coming in every day, but 495 is going out every day. So every day, two, three, four, five ml or 10 ml is accumulating. Over the next few weeks, slowly that water becomes more. And again, like the pressure cooker effect, because of the skull is, you know, doesn't expand, you have pressure on the brain. In those situations, we have to remove the fluid. As an emergency, especially if there's blood clot inside, we cannot put a permanent solution. We make a small hole on the top, we drill something called a burr hole and put something called an EBD or external ventricular drain. You see many of our patients in our stories having just two bumps even on their head that you can see. These are all burr holes for, done for EBD. We keep the tube to the outside. We allow the dirty fluid to come out, you know, and then once it becomes clearer, we either take it off and see whether it, the path, uh, pathway is re-established or if it is not re-established, then what do we do is we have to put a permanent bypass and overflow tube. So what do we do from a hole in the skull? We put the tube under the skin into the abdominal cavity or into the abdominal cavity wall, through the wall, and that fluid gets absorbed. It's only overflow. It has a pressure control valve and extra fluid only drains out and not all the fluid because regular fluid is required. So this is called a VP shunting. That is done very commonly, 30 to 40 patient, percent of our patients need a VP shunt. Even if you do the shunt, there's no problem. The patients have done a VP shunt 10, 15, 18 years ago who are back at work. So that by itself is not bad, it's permanent, it goes on, it's like your, your drainage pipe is blocked and you put a new pipe, that's all it is. It's as logically simple as that. So this is about intercerebral hematoma and the possible complications of hydrocephalus that can happen. And this brings end to the second, uh, uh, the other episode of the stroke series, which is treatment of intercerebral hematomas, especially with surgery. Thank you very much and thank you for watching.